All right, um, I'll just get Carolina to start here. Hello, yes. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having us. Uh, I hope you're all well there in Canada, and I'm sorry we could not join you today. Uh, but let's just get to it. So my name is Carolina Rossini, and I uh, am the co-founder and the director for research and partnership at the Data Sphere Initiative. Uh, I've been working in tech and policy for over 20 years uh, and worked a lot on uh, open data uh, and back in early 2000s in Creative Commons issues. So all this is very dear to my heart. So I'm, I'm sorry I'm not there in person. But anyway, so the session will explore how data governance uh, models and frameworks impact the ways in which data can be leveraged to tackle global challenges such, such as climate change, uh, so far and so on. Um, our goal here uh, is to discuss uh, an idea of open and uh, moving beyond uh, open, uh, the value of holistic data governance in times of crisis. Uh, there is a, a lot of complexity that came up after the idea of open uh, uh, has been advocated for so many years, right? And now we think about what are the friction we have to include back on those models so we can responsibly unlock the value of data for all. Uh, well, to discuss all of this today, we have our panelist, Johannes, who is with us online, uh, I think connecting from the sea. Thank you, Johannes, uh, for joining us. And Cassie, who is there with you, who will share why this holistic approach to data governance is essential to an effective open data and open data strategies. Johan Fredericks is the director of climate data at the World Resources Institute, which is a global research organization that addresses urgent sustainability challenges related to food, forests, water, climate, energy, cities, and the ocean. He leads data strategy on climate, energy, and systems change. We also have with us today, Cassie Raymond, uh, who is a technical manager at the Global Burden of Animal Disease, an international initiative that aims to improve decision-making for animal health by integrating data from a variety of sources and sharing tools for analysis. She has also been a part of our first cohort of fellows at the Data Sphere Initiative, where she developed a lot of research on data graphs, categorization, interoperability, and data quality. It was wonderful to have Cassie this year with us and learn so much uh, from her uh, expertise. Uh, you can find more information in some links we are going to be sharing in the chat. So uh, to not hold uh, anybody back anymore, let's just jump to some questions I wanna, that I, I would like the panelists to address. So perhaps starting with Cassie, uh, at the GBADs, you have been collecting open data to measure the economic and health burden of animal diseases on humans and animals. What are the challenges and obstacles that you have faced when working on this? Cassie. Thanks. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? I think so. I think the mic's working. Um, so before going into the specifics about the obstacles, I just wanted to provide a bit more information about the type of data the Global Burden of Animal Diseases or GBADS has been collecting. So with the overarching goal, as Carol mentioned, of creating uh, models uh, to estimate the economic and health burden of animal diseases on animals and humans at global and national levels, um, the, the main objective of the GBADS informatics team, which I'm on, has been collecting, curating, and disseminating data related to these calculations. And the one metric that we've started with and we really need to know is the number of livestock of a given species um, there are in countries and in the world. And we need to know this by age of animal, by production system, by utility of the animal and by sex. So we've started with animal per, uh, population numbers because they're key inputs to biomass, um, which GBADS modelers are using in their disease attribution models. Um, however, it's important to note that these numbers are critical in other estimates as well. Um, 
they have huge impact when it comes to policy and decision making. So for instance, animal population numbers are used in calculations related to One Health challenges, and that is challenges uh, at the intersection of human, animal, and environmental health, such as climate change, so greenhouse gas emissions, nutrition and protein availability, and antimicrobial resistance. And this all includes being able to reuse and integrate data from various sources, including open data, and to compare the data between the sources and over time to see progress and change. So starting with these key numbers, the livestock population numbers, the main challenges for us um, include issues with interoperability, including semantic interoperability of the data. So interoperability, which is the ability to exchange information, um, can first be associated with the ability to actually access the information that we need in some kind of digitized format. So livestock population data is available from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations Statistical Database, FAUSTAT. Um, they provide data for countries, but not at the level of granularity that's needed to perform the calculations, because we need the data by, uh, like I said, uh, sex production system, age, and utility. So this type of data is openly available from governments or from Eurostat in uh, the case of member countries of the EU. However, on the country level, first off, it might not be available in a digitized format. Obviously in Canada, we have open data portals, so that's not necessarily an issue. But in the case of Ethiopia, we actually had to go and scrape PDF documents um, because the data wasn't available publicly. So in this instance, the data were not interoperable at a foundational level, um, and we had to overcome this challenge by scraping the data and making it machine actionable. But once we actually have the data, the next challenge is understanding the context, understanding what the data means and how it was collected. And this is a part that we call semantic interoperability or the unambiguous exchange of the meaning of the data between a sender and receiver, whether that sender and receiver be machine to machine, machine to human, or human to human. And without this context or a definition of the categories or naming conventions um, being provided, including relevant metadata or standards, it's so difficult to derive the meaning from this data and actually use it. Um, and so what I mean by this is a name of uh, the names of the same categories can have completely different meanings. So this subjects the data to misinterpretation from a user, making the integration and comparison and reuse of the data extremely difficult. Um, so something that I did was look at how organizations are naming these livestock population categories. So in an analysis, looking at livestock population data from Eurostat, FAUSTAT, the Ethiopian Central Statistics Agency, and the World Organization for Animal Health, or WOA, there were over 100 naming conventions for livestock, making interoperability between these data sets, all reporting the same types of number, extremely hard to establish. It's so hard to integrate these. We have to figure out whether the number of poultry birds means the same thing as the number of chickens, or whether it's the sum of hens, turkeys, chicks, guinea fowl, or is a dairy cow the same thing as adult female cattle greater than two years of age, or does it also include adult female cattle less than two years of age not used for rearing? So <laughs> there's a lack of standards in this sense. And then you have the policy side of things where there's a call for the use of standards to improve the interoperability of the data. We see this in calls for action um, from data strategies. Stats Canada has one, where short-term activities include research and selection of data standards, use of taxonomies, ontologies, and vocabularies. We see this in a call for an integrated international data system in the World Bank's World Development Report 2021. And we see this in the Ethiopian data strategy as well. So we're supposed to adopt standards but what are the standards? So in the case of national livestock data at a country level, the categories used to collect the data are mandated in legislation um, in a lot of cases. So in Canada, it's a national statistics or national agricultural data act that mandates how livestock animals are to be categorized, how we're collecting the data. In the European Union, the legislation requires member states to report national livestock statistics according to a set of categories mandated in that act, and member states might also have their own set of requirements on a national government level. 
So we have data strategies saying that we need interoperability and standards and, other, and another set of poli policies that are actually enforcing the standards to begin with. And this is a huge silo. Um, and then there's other standards from the technical community that haven't really last. So <laughs> the challenge is really reconciling this data, figuring out a way to use and integrate the past data and find a way forward to bridge these policy and technical gaps that we see in the enforcement of standards and, um, and uh, then leverage the data. Uh, so that's all for me for that question. Sorry, a little bit of a rant there. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. No, I think that's great information to, to pose some of the difficulties even when we are working with open data. So to, to turn uh, the mic to Johannes. So Johannes, you have uh, ex extensive experience working with data platforms to track the impact of climate change and protect the planet. What do you consider are the risks of using open data in your field? Uh, especially, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you, everyone. Um, and I put some um, links in the chat that you can explore by yourself. We're a little bit over time, so I won't want any screen sharing. Um, and you can you can go into some of these platforms as an example yourself. Um, to just uh, go a little bit, um, I'm, I'm going to do this like a little bit more higher level, kind of on the experience that we've um, uh, had with with uh, these type of data platforms. And it's also, uh, to be clear, I'm, I'm coming from, uh, uh, we would call it a science-driven driven do tank. <laughs> so we're not an academic organization, but we uh, really aim to have measurable change based on the tools, insight and data that we publish, uh, which is not easy. And um, when it comes to, when it comes to uh, data, data governance, um, the topic of this, I, I have like, um, I have, three main messages or insights kind of things that we've learned over the years working on uh, a lot of these data, data pl platforms, some of which I will mention as an example. Um, the one is uh, uh, do co-development with the right, uh, with your users, as well as with the right partners across all of your stages. Um, so this is kind of a thing that we've uh, that we often see that um, while people talk about uh, the need for better data or there's a lack of data, they often do um, create this quite in in isolation. So uh, what we've learned uh, with a lot of trial and error is that it's really important even in the early design stage when you even set your research agenda when you say what you actually want to do to talk to whoever might use the data or whoever might might benefit from it. Um, and this is sometimes this can be anything from from uh, the academic communities to actually like some of the governments you want to work with or some of the local city actors or some of the uh, um, uh, people in low income countries that are actually uh, do not have a technical background. Um, so this is kind of like a key thing that we've seen uh, to do this, not not just at like some points where we say, oh, we had like these kind of conversations with some of the people that we think are end users, but having it. Uh, consistently through the process from from the beginning uh, to the end. Uh, the second piece is uh, be explicit about uh, the role that your project has and the value add that it has. So um, uh, this is kind of like a thing that uh, we've seen quite often that uh, people talk about use cases um, often, but in many cases don't actually quite understand what that actually means or might not take it serious enough. So for example, when people, uh, one of the typical flags um, that we've seen often when people start uh, saying, oh, we're targeting decision makers or policy makers. Um, <laughs> that often means they don't actually know who the end user is because decision makers and policy makers is such a broad term. It can be anything from like, uh, local pharma decision makers uh, in sub-Saharan Africa to like a member of parliament in the in the UK and they obviously have like vastly different um, vastly different needs vastly different technical knowledge and so on so it's very important to be explicit uh, on what value you're actually trying to add and it's okay to not target decision makers. So this is going to be the first example that we have um, uh, with this project um, that I put in the chat, uh, which is called Power Explorer, the Power Plant Database. If you just Google Power Plant Database, um, uh, it's a it's a database in its core. Um, 
is it going to be does it actually influence decision makers or like like actually the people who might like create your awesome policies probably not directly but it it has been a successful uh, uh, um, project in that it helped a lot of other organizations and this is mostly more on the academic on the research on the modeler side to for example use the power plant data to model energy demand to uh, look at the impacts of, of 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 water use from power plants and so on that can be then used to inform decision makers but we've been realistic in saying this is like just because we publish a database doesn't mean that it like the the end users are these type of decision makers they can be also academics and then we've we've done a lot of um and I hope to publish a blog about this eventually uh we've done a lot of uh uh, overviews or thinking about what kind of role these kind of data um, um, uh, uh, tools can play. Um, to give you some example, this can range in some cases to not even create new data. One of the most successful projects that we had at WRI is the, called, uh, the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, um, which uh, basically stems from the problem that uh, companies didn't have any standards to actually, when they say, here's our emissions that we emit, they didn't know, like, like, how do you even measure this? How do we make it comparable? And we've uh, created a st standard across the greenhouse gas protocol that's now used by over 90% of the Fortune 500 companies um, so that they can actually, if they say, here's our emissions, they are actually comparable across, um, across companies. But we hadn't created any data with this. It's, it, it was an interactive process which was governed and um, and uh, push forward very collaboratively with the end users to uh, to build consensus. So there might be often things where you actually where like to solve a data issue, you might not actually need to create data first. <laughs> it might actually be about like consensus finding. And then there's all the also other projects. Uh, again, like put them in the chat. You can Google them easily. Um, uh, Climate Watch being one example, but it was uh, just a new tool that we just launched last week, um, which is called the Systems Change Lab which is tracking progress um, on a lot of different environmental issues to see how we can actually like achieve the Paris Agreement, mitigate climate change, adapt to climate change, but also help biodiversity loss and uh, have a just transition. Um, and a lot of the data that's on there is actually not new in a sense, but the tracking that we're doing is new. And we are very, we are very concrete there in uh, the value that we're adding for whom. So we're not saying this platform is for everyone, but for example, particularly interesting for funding organization or people who want to set their goals, philanthropies um, and, and certain government agencies that are, that are setting certain targets. Um, so be explicit what you're trying to do, but also uh, say it's okay that you can't do everything. So this is um, uh, number two. And then number three, very really quick, is uh, make sure that data is the actual problem. Uh, in some cases, we always talk about like, let's get new data. Data is the data. If we have more data, what you can measure, you can manage. And, and yes, data is sometimes a baseline and a base requirement. But um, also be realistic. Is it actually the data that's missing? Is it the political will? Is it the knowledge? Is it sometimes the capacity, the insight? Is the data actionable? Um, and this is kind of like a message that I also have like to some of the people who are planning their projects as well as to funders being just like, be realistic. Not every project can have a massive impact just with, with data because a lot of times you need like other pieces to this or you might need more campaigns than just like, than, than just like pure data. Um, but yeah, so these are kind of like three high level messages of what we've learned um, through all of this work that we've been doing um uh, co-development across all stages with your with your end user and ideally co-governance uh be explicit about your role and your value adders and what you're not doing uh, what you're not doing and making sure that like the when you say you're going to make change with data data is the actual like barrier to 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 action um so quick awesome. summary <laughs> thank, you, Haynes. Um, thank you so much you covered a lot of things including some of the Something that would go towards my next question around your recommendations. So I'm gonna put a couple of questions here together, uh, Cassie and Johannes. Um, so I was actually talking with the folks at the data uh, lab at the World Bank recently, right? And and one of the things they told me, but also other folks in the field, is that lots of organizations are producing data goods, right, or data products, or some some form of knowledge out of data um, 
and they want to share with policymakers or a certain target audience that supposedly has to do something with that and produce a certain impact on the ground, right? Right. But especially in the global south, and I'm from Brazil originally, right? There is a lack of potentially data literacy uh, on the ground to really uh, use and, and benefit from these data goods. In your fields, uh, how do you see this? And, and how do, what are the recommendations you have moving forward, right? Um, is something that we need to do on the side of data? how open data helps in that or is something that we need to do on the side of the people that we want to benefit from the products you guys are generating right um cassie do you want to start and then perhaps your hands you're just mute. because oh yes. can you hear me yeah, yeah okay <laughs> I said I'll pivot a little bit from my rant about standards for a second because um, the informatics well, theme we at standards. <laughs> uh, the informatics theme at GBADS also does uh, work on data products, um, including dashboards and, as I mentioned, liberating some of the data that's locked in PDF documents uh, for countries that might not have the infrastructure to support a more modern data dissemination. Um, so we had some colleagues actually, actually just go to Ethiopia and do a stakeholders meeting. How do the data products like the dashboards and the digitization of the data impact you um, as a people from the Central Statistics Agency in Ethiopia? And, and is it worth our while to continue doing these exercises? Um, and we. I just got emails actually last night with incredible feedback from the people from the Ethiopia CSA saying that they want to be more involved in this process so then they can continue doing the digitization um, at, at their level at, in their own country. So this was a great response because it's one thing for us as GBADS, a program that wants to, you know, you know do this modeling and as a someone who's more on the tech side, as someone that wants to do the coding and the data governance stuff. But it's another thing to see that direct impact on um, the people that it's their data, you know what I mean? They make it available in these PDF documents, but they don't have it digitized. So now we're, we're going to be working with them um, and they're one of our stakeholders to make the data products better for them and teach them to use some of the tools that we've created. So accessing these databases um, and bridging some of the silos that they, they said that they have um, on a national level in terms of just the data not being able to be integrated um, between different silos in the statistics agency. So I'm not sure if that quite answers your question, but I think it kind of brings together some of the things that, uh, we were talking about, about identifying those key stakeholders. How does this data actually have impact? And I mean, I guess we'll see that more when they're able to get a hold of their own data in this better, more open form and see whether um, it does have impact and they're able to do things with it to measure progress on a national level. Yeah. Thank you, Cassie. No, I think you're right. And one of the things we see is a increased movement around what is the value of data, right? Uh, who the data benefits. So uh, this example of the, uh, the, the guys on the field reaching out and saying, hey, I wanna be part of this. I wanna be part of the design. Exactly. Right? I think that's the way we all need to go, right? Um, there is a lot of discussions around data coming out of smart cities on the same way, right? What data are gonna capture for who and why will that benefit I invest in my city or will that benefit citizens, right? And I think, jo Johannes, we were talking something similar around your work, uh, but I would love to hear your response to that and, and perhaps some of the recommendations you have in mind. Yeah, to, to build on what, what, what uh, uh, Cassie said, um, and, and interesting things that we've often observe is uh, in, in our line of work is that there's actually a big gap in, um, uh, in data use, um, that in many cases, the data, as she said, like, like might be even there, people might be even collecting them, but then there's like somewhere locked up in PDFs. This can be, sometimes it can be like the standardization, the issue, sometimes it can be like the data formats, the openness and so on. But 
in some cases, there's also like often other issues that we've seen in that uh, 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 like data might be actually open um, and sitting around there, but it's still not usable to people. So uh, to give you the example of Climate Watch, um, uh, a lot of the data, uh, we have like the most comprehensive data sets around countries, uh, global greenhouse gas emissions by sector, by country for uh, over 150 years uh, that you can explore. Um, we are not collecting this data by ourselves with countries. We are taking what's already out there and we're compiling it and we're making it really, really easily understandable and um, uh, uh, and explorable and usable. And that's kind of like a thing where we're seeing things like the data is actually there. It's just not in a way that uh, the users that actually have very specific questions have their very specific problems like, uh, a lot of these countries are now creating new um, uh, national climate plans, these NDCs, and they need to know both what is the spectrum of GHG emissions that our country has, what's the, what are the trends, what do other countries, what kind of actions do other countries do. And in theory, that information is out there, but what we do is partner with, the, with, with some of the international organization, with some of the academic institutions that are publishing this data and, and really translating it um, for them to say, here's the, here's some of the key insights that you actually want to find out. And you can always dive deeper. It's a very, like we're building these, that's why we're building these very interactive tools. Um, and then a very definite things that we've always found, um, which is why it's like so so interesting um, what, what, what Cassie said as well, uh, being just like having these conversations with some of the end users and the stakeholders there, um, is we've switched most of our activities from Climate Watch away from the technical side and actually spend over 50% of all of our time just on trainings and working with the end users. And the interesting thing is that, is that we like the tool, if people go there, they usually say like, I love it. It's really cool. It's really like, it's, it's, it's uh, a great interactivity and usability. But at the end of the day, they still need some of the basic trainings. Most of the people that we're talking with and we've like trained uh, probably around 3000 people over <laughs> the last two years in the tool, they, their questions are so basic. Their questions are often like so simple where we're being just like, oh, um, uh, we thought you need like, you need to really dive in or need the most com complex data kind of that you can do. And they might need over time, but at the end of the day, often some of them like, like some of the, some of the basic understandings of the, the have some really basic questions that they just want to have answered immediately. So this is kind of where we've seen like, if we actually want to translate that data into something that's that we say is impactful and drives outcomes and so on, a lot of this actually working with users and and uh, in our case just literally just training them, is uh, um, is we found as a hugely helpful activities to do. <laughs> Thank you, Johannes, and um, we are having a good discussion on the uh, in the chat if PDF uh, is helps is really open data or not right one thing is to think about open data the license piece but the other thing is to really think about making it accessible uh and easily accessible and usable uh but thank you Lee, for so maybe we can open for questions i don't know if there are questions there in the audience live or uh if you have a question and you're online please put it in the chat and if not i do have more questions but Cassie, are any hands up there? No, but I know they're pretty lively, so I'm sure someone has something for us at the end of today. <laughs> or they ran out, out of coffee, I don't know. <laughs> Folks are shy over there. Um, I know it's Not hard too to, much. to have hybrid panels sometimes. Um, well, one of the things I want to bring, I want to ask you is, um, how much of the data you work with is actually open data or in which stage of openness the data is, right? From not just the license part, but also the technical part. And if you had any pushback on that, right? I remember uh, some anecdotes on biodiversity being put it out there, open data on biodiversity. And then you have hunters from the global north going visit uh folks in colombia right and hunt down animals because there was open data about the local biodiversity uh but 
how do you feel about that? How are the, 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 the negatives? How are perhaps the friction we have to put back in open data to deal with these uh, unintended consequences? And if, if you encounter anything like that in your sectors. Johans? Yeah, I'm happy to respond uh, quickly to it because I know we're also getting uh, over time, but um, uh, yes, there's actually a lot of cases where, um, where data isn't open. I always like this quote, um, uh, which many of you have, have, have heard, which is um, it, uh, data, data wants to be free, um, uh, but uh, not everyone actually knows that there's actually a second part to this. Um, if you Google it, there's um, data wants to be free, uh, because it wants to be shared, it can be really useful if it's free and open. But then there's a second part, which is uh, data doesn't does actually wants to be closed and wants to be expensive because it's valuable, and it's like it's it's something that gives you a cutting edge, and it's something that that uh, re requires effort. And we've definitely seen a lot uh, in the climate change area where um, it, we had to work with organizations organizations to really say that the the real the value of their data increases significantly if it's open. Um, so some of my happiest moments were if uh, when we worked with other NGOs and we partners with them, which is why why governance is actually so important, inclusive governance that you're not doing your projects in uh, in isolation, but trying to partner with with other organizations around the space. Is that there was a, 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 a big German NGO that was doing actually a lot of data analysis, and they were government funded and uh, mission driven. Uh, but all their data was closed because they really wanted to be like, this is our data and this is our cutting edge and this gives us funding kind of things. And then convincing them that they should actually also have some kind of open data commitment um, was definitely a little highlight of my career where it's like, where we've actually seen that this is actually makes a change. We've also worked a lot with, for example, international organizations uh, of which not, not uh, uh, every single one, particularly calling out the International Energy Agency here, um, uh, has most of the data behind a paywall. And there's a lot of effort going, going on um, to, to trying to see if this uh, data could actually be much more openly available. And it's a, it's, it really works if you just, just like, if you understand that like, it's just people behind the scenes. It's just people who have like, who needs to be like, understand being just, just like, that's, that's actually not, it's not a threat, it's an opportunity. Um, and uh, sometimes it works. <laughs> so yeah, there's lots of data that is unfortunately, that's unfortunately not open yet, um, but I've seen great success and great progress if you if you just make the case and show what can be done with open data, particularly in just examples, like all of our work is open, completely open source, and how much it can be collaborative and how much it can be have an impact exactly because it is open source. Thank you, Johannes. Uh, and uh, go ahead, Cassie. Sorry, I know that we're just about out of time, but I just wanted to speak quickly to the the fact about the paywalls um, and closed data because sometimes with open data, we've also had some issues uh, with the quality. So just agreeability between data sources um, that are reporting the same thing. So a lot of the times, and we've had discussions like this at, at the data sphere and our meetings as well, we think, naively maybe, I don't know, um, that that private data is better. It's behind a paywall. It's, you know, it must be more valuable. Um, but is it really? <laughs> like, can you actually use it with the open data that is readily available for you? Um, or does it have its own problems with quality? So I think that's another thing that's important to note because behind a paywall, we want it more almost. It seems like maybe it has more value, but is it worth the risk to pay the money to get it? Or can we use what's open and try to enrich the open sources um, so they better fit our needs? That's that's kind of what I, my stance on the, the paywall bit, but. Sometimes you do need that private data. Sometimes you do need to pay for it. So I get that as well, but it would be nice to see things more open. Thank you, Cassie. I couldn't agree more. Uh, having started working on openness issues back in the late 90s, early 2000s, I couldn't agree more. And especially when there is public investment, right? And public funds into research. But then there is always the, the issue of incentives, right? Like how can we change some incentives so 
people, scientists, researchers uh, make data open and even companies learn to perhaps develop new business models, perhaps around services, but open the data, right? Uh, because you're right, it might not be the best data. But anyway, uh, I know we need to wrap up. Um, so I shared in the chat, but if you are not in your computer, which I see you, uh, do check out the website of the datasphere.org. Um, there is an awesome atlas where we mapped almost 300 organizations doing work on data uh, and data governance. We have a very cool literature review report coming out in December on the meaning of data governance and how that has changed over time and brought some communities together from data management to uh, in the business sector to open data uh, to, to things like privacy, right? And, and we bring organizations that don't work purely in privacy, but organizations that understand privacy has a part of a bigger problem, especially now that lots of countries are developing their national data strategies, which uh, we work a lot on. So we are working at the Data Sphere, which is a nonprofit with the G7 and G20 countries, helping them figure out their national data strategies. So please be in contact uh, if uh, you want to learn more. Uh, everything is Creative Commons license in our website. And I just want to thank the organizers for having us and facilitating this. Uh, Cassie, Johannes, uh for joining us today. And also Mariana, uh, who is uh, our awesome research researcher at the Data Sphere and has joined us today too. So thank you all and um, good, good evening, good rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Joins. Wow. So that uh, that brings us back to back to the stage here to talk about, you know, basically what did we learn overall? Like it's these stories from the trenches where, you, where you're talking to people who are actually trying to make a difference. They're applying the standards, they're trying to clean data, they're trying to uh, impact the world around them and to see that in action and all the challenges and all the innovation that goes with that. Uh, it's amazing to have those stories uh, with us. So thank you very much for that presentation. Now, before we kind of go into the, the final wrap here, I want to ask Paul Connor to come up if you'd like to say a few words to, uh, to the folks. Paul is the president of the Canadian Open Data Society, uh, the key organizer and sponsor of this whole event. So Paul, why don't you come up here and say hi to the people. Thank you. I wasn't actually going to say anything, but uh, then something came to mind. Uh, I think uh, we've had a lot of people talk uh, very well about uh, ways to improve our practices, our processes, our governance. But uh, I, and there's even some big picture stuff that people like uh, Jamie Boyd uh, talk about, but uh, I don't think anyone really set the cat among the pigeons yet. So I'm gonna arrogate that task to myself. <laughs> Uh, I want to encourage everyone uh, online and here in, in Whitehorse to think even bigger about open data. It's now a fairly well-established practice, but we need it to become more. And I'll, I'll tell you why. To my mind, it should become a profession and then a community of practice taking on a life of its own. And our society is actually working to germinate that community. So do look us up at opendatasociety.ca and join. Uh, but uh, that is a, a work in progress that uh, needs everyone uh, to be hauling. And finally, and most controversially perhaps, uh, I think open data should someday become recognized as nothing less than one of the key checks and balances of our society. Like our democratic elections, uh, governed by a nonpartisan agency in Canada or a free press or our independent judiciary. And dare I say it, just to keep uh, this memorable for everyone, uh, just like our constitutional monarchy, which is like the apolitical referee of our political process, uh, I think open data should take its place among all of these as a check and balance in our society. And given the state of our world today, I think this has become increasingly imperative. So if this, uh, meaning all of you, um, uh, resonates, uh, 
or I, I should say, if this resonates uh, with all of you, uh, keeping in mind uh, the greater meaning of, of your efforts in light of that uh, possibility, uh, please join our community online so we can uh, fire on all cylinders. And I truly believe this will help keep us on track to an ever more prosperous, secure, and peaceful Canada. Thank you. So we've heard an awful lot about data governance. We've seen ideas. We've talked about the big picture ideas. We've got right down into like the code level discussions. Uh, we've seen practical ways to deal with data. We've, we've talked about concepts and, and how to apply them to our daily work. We've talked about social impact. We've talked about the arts. We talked about science. We have covered a lot of stuff over the last couple of days. And I, you know, the, the breadth of perspectives that have joined us both online and in this room has has truly blown my mind. So I really appreciate that part of the discussion. Um, if you're looking, I'm gonna just cover off a couple of things. If you're looking for access to a couple of things, one is all the video material from all the sessions. So if you went to one and you kind of wish you could have gone to another one that was happening at the same time, you're gonna be able to get that online. The other thing is there's some video on demand. There are some sessions in the app that that the, the, the were, that's where you'll find them. They weren't uh, part of the live lineup, but they are uh, available to members here. So. So dig into that app. It's the Upstream app if you haven't already downloaded it uh, onto your phone. Uh, the next thing is uh, is uh, talking a little bit about the folks who have helped us out here. So we should talk about sponsors, the Government of Canada, Government of Yukon, Microsoft, uh, Esri Canada, uh, of course, the Canadian Open Data Society, the board there, the volunteers there. Uh, so many so much time spent on the phone with, with Paul and Derek and, and Dave talking about how this is all going to work. So uh, and across all kinds of time zones. So, you know, the amount of amount of time those guys put in um, uh, my own e-services team at work for essentially creating the bandwidth for me to participate. So uh, appreciate that. Uh, the AV crew, the, po the people at Upstream who have been juggling like a massively complex hybrid thing in the north, time zones, all of that stuff. So thank you guys for keeping that moving for us. Uh, and certainly... <laughs> certainly the service... Uh, that we've received here at the hotel, the food, uh, the, the staff, the keeping up with the moving food in, moving food out and getting everyone, keeping everyone happy. You know, that has been great. And then, uh, and then ultimately the delegates, you know, the ones in the room, the ones online, the people who have been sharing their ideas, have been sharing their inspiration, have been sharing what they know. Uh, and, and then the opportunity to spend time, socialize, expand your network, meet new people, like all of that has been fantastic. You know, I think a lot of, for a lot of people, People that I've talked to, you know, this is the first chance they've had to get back to a summit, back to their community, back to, um, you know, that kind of old fashioned learning that that is in three dimensions. So, you know, I've really enjoyed that the hybrid model, like it does work and it and it gives options, but it has been a real treat to spend time, uh, you know, with with the people in the room here. So I appreciate everyone who a lot of you traveled a long way to be here uh, and appreciate that as well. Uh, you know, the weather can be tricky in White Horse right now, a little bit uh, chilly. So, you know, thanks everyone for uh, putting up with that. So with that, we uh, are gonna say, um, there's gonna be a feedback mechanism. So you'll be getting a survey. So we're gonna create a data set and this data set's gonna be feedback on this uh, event. So when you get that link, you know, you're probably gonna think, oh, I got stuff to do. But if you can go in there and you can provide that feedback. So next year, when you get an invite to this thing, you're gonna see the improvements that you've provided your thoughts on. Uh, give us the shout outs, tell us the things you like, but also tell us the things that we could do that would be better. And then, uh, and then finally, I wanna I wanna thank you for visiting and uh, have safe travels home. And with those final words, I am gonna call the uh, 2022 Canadian Open Data Summit will be adjourned. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Sorry. Big round of applause for Mark as well, please. Uh, yeah. So Michael here is put together kind of this stand. Uh, we had a little bit of an idea for all the attendees to so just come up on stage. We'll take a quick picture as a nice memory of having come here and participated in this. So if you can all come closer towards the stage, that'd be great. We'll take a photo. Ha, ha, ha.
I think it was actually, I remember being grade seven, it was the shortest of three days. Oh, really? So we're all kind of 